Hello and welcome to the first video in a little mini series talking about something called iNav. Now I have been using iNav for a very long time and it's great to see more of the hobby jumping on the iNav bandwagon. But one of the things that I've noticed recently is lots of pilots are coming to iNav for the first time, particularly from things like fixed wing and getting into trouble because iNav and the setup of iNav is their first experience with flight controllers, PC companion software, flashing firmware, radio profiles, flight modes, and it's blowing their minds a little bit. So this, if you're in that boat, is absolutely for you. If you already understand beta flight, then a lot of the stuff I'm going to go through in this video in particular isn't going to be news to you. So I'd recommend checking out the other iNav builds that are all over the channel. But first of all, let's talk a little bit about what iNav is. That, that I'm holding in my hand, is not iNav. That is a flight controller. You can think of it like a little computer. And on here are gyroscopes, accelerometers, potentially barometers that can measure changes in air pressure so you can measure your height. Uh, but it hasn't got any software on it. And the software that you can put on here can be lots of different things. So you've heard of things like uh, beta flight, you'll have heard of things like Ardu plane or maybe Ardu copter or Ardu pilot maybe. And iNav or iNav flight is one of that family. Now iNav has been around for quite a few years. It is a relation of beta flight that I'm sure you've heard of. But iNav, rather when beta flight went off to concentrate and develop solutions for very, very locked in fast flying of multi-rotors, iNav went in a different direction to add GPS capabilities and it stayed on that track and the GPS stuff in iNav is fantastic which is one of the reasons I use it but I'll talk about that in a second but also it has a fantastic setup on here for fixed wing which is why I use it so much for fixed wing and that's really why I use iNav there's a couple of main reasons really the first is that um, when you set something like this up, you can make it behave like a stabilizer. So it makes the plane easier to fly and you can add things like an auto level. So if you let go of the sticks, the plane or whatever you're flying will kind of self right and fly straight and level. Now, if that's all you want, then iNav is probably going to be overkill. Get yourself a nice stabilizer. Uh, if you want a little bit more uh, things like... Um, auto launch and return to home so for example one of the other things i like about inav is it just means that if you're a wing flyer or you like to uh, go flying but unfortunately you have to do it on your own and you haven't got somebody who can throw the model for you having something like an auto launch feature is great because you just arm the model you throw the thing inav catches it and just takes off into the air and makes the launching a piece of cake Similarly, on the other side of the flight, uh, you've also got the return to home. So in the event of a problem with your radio, the connection, or maybe flying too far away or something going wrong, or maybe you just having a moment and needing to flick your ODIR switch, the model will then fly back to you. Now in iNav, if it's on a multi-rotor, it'll fly back to you and then it'll actually land and disarm. On a fixed wing model, uh, you can set it to try and land if you really want to, but actually, you can. Uh, what it'll do is kind of circle or loiter around the home location to give you a chance to uh, settle your nerves if that's what, what the problem was, or get a new battery in your radio, or maybe reconnect to the model and to bring it down safely. And that ODIR switch is really, really useful. There are other systems around that kind of give you that. Uh, some of the stuff from uh, DTERM, the Z3 FPV unit, things like the Copilot from ZOHD, all do that without having the complexity of iNav. But having an ODIR switch in particularly when you're learning or you're trying FPV is a very, very handy thing to have if you get disorientated. And that is the last great thing about this. It will give you a full on-screen display. So if you are flying FPV with the goggles on, so you're looking out of a camera based on the model, then you can have all your critical flight information overlaid around the edges of the view. Things like your battery voltage, how much battery you've used, how much you've got left, your altitude, your speed, how many satellites you've got locked on, your current heading, the distance and direction to home, the amount of throttle you're using, the, uh, the amount of power that you're using so the estimated remaining flight time you can have loads and loads of stuff and that if you're flying fpv 
is blooming handy particularly if you're flying in somewhere that you've never flown before having even a direction and distance to home arrow so that you don't lose orientation and think oh blimey where am i can be very very handy indeed so that's why inav gets put in an awful lot of my fixed wings if for no other reason then it gives me that oh dear switch and the ability to have that overlay in my on-screen display when i'm flying fpv it is also very handy because you've got other flight modes. I'll talk about flight modes later. And by putting this in, you can set it up so that the plane or whatever it is it's in becomes a lot more docile and easier to learn to fly on. So it can be handy at that as well, because essentially it's acting like a little kind of automatic pilot and how much of an automatic pilot you can select by the flight mode. Now, to make this work, you need a couple of extra things. Obviously, you're going to need some kind of hardware, this little computer. Uh, this is a Matek F765, uh, but there's loads of different versions around. If you actually look on the iNav website, I'll put a link down below. There's a whole list of supported flight controllers. Uh, these days, pretty much everything is supported. The only tip I'll give you is now, get an F4 or F7 based piece of hardware, a flight controller, because the support for F3 is going away. And F3, F4, and F7 is just talking about how powerful the processor is. And the more powerful processors are needed, unfortunately, these days to kind of run the modern software. Kind of similar to the way that PCs work. You know, once you've had your PC for five or six years, uh, it starts to struggle to run some of the latest software. It's kind of the same in this part of the hobby as well. You will also need a compatible GPS uh, receiver. I use the M8N. So Mother 8 November M8N GPS is, and you can plug that in and then that will do all the GPS stuff. The GPS will also allow it to uh, monitor its height and also give you speed indications and also sort out direction of flight and all that kind of jazz as well. So uh, that's the only other part of the system that you really need and everything after there is kind of optional. Uh, obviously, assuming that you have a receiver in your model that talks SBUS, and you have uh, the model with all the servos and the SCL ready to go. You will probably need some basic soldering and crimping skills. Uh, there are a couple of options around uh, things like the Furious FPV Lightning F35. The names are great, aren't they? Uh, it was more plug and play. Hopefully there's gonna be a new version of that coming out. A lot of the flight controllers come these days don't have these pins attached. So unfortunately, you do have to spend a happy 20 minutes uh, soldering them all on. So if uh, you are not a fan of soldering or you don't like crimping to crimp wires onto the end of the GPS wires to kind of put them onto these pins, then uh, it might be worthwhile if you're buying it from a local hobby shop, talking to them very nicely and asking them to solder the pins on for you. So how does iNav actually work? Well, it's quite straightforward. It kind of sits between the receiver and all the other controls in your model. So what it does is it's listening to where all the controls are on your radio and it's doing all the mixing and everything for all the control, the servos in a fixed wing, for example. So rather than you flying all of this bits directly, it sits in between and it's interpreting what you want the model to do from the radio and then making the model do it by moving all the control surfaces and feeling how the model is reacting. Now you can decide how much help you get from iNav. You can have it in something called manual or acro mode. You can have the minimum amount of support and things like acro mode, for example, will give you full control of the model, but it will give you that kind of stabilizer feel. So it will correct for uncommanded movement. So if the wind pushes the model a little bit, it'll try and uh, work against that. In manual mode, that's exactly what it says in the tin. All the flight controller does is the mixing. So even if you're running a V-tail or a flying wing and normally on your radio you do lots of mixing and setups, you don't do any of that for iNav. You have one basic model type and then you tell iNav how the channels are ordered. And once you've done that, then iNav is the bit that kind of decides how all the control surfaces are going to move. So that means that even on very basic radios, you can control quite sophisticated models. Then you've got other modes like angle mode. Angle mode will limit the pitch and roll uh, by default to about 30 degrees, which is very, very uh, small in my humble opinion, but it means that you can't loop and roll it. 
great if you're learning to fly and also that provides you with an auto level so if you let go of the stick then the model will go and fly straight and level so that is definitely the mode if you're going to hand your stick over to uh, a young pilot who's never really flown before or a new pilot uh, i put it in angle mode and there's it, they're going to have to work really hard to smash it into the ground although i've seen it happen Altitude mode, using the barometer that's inside here and also the GPS to measure the height, it can make sure that it flies at the same level all the time. Similarly, there are advanced modes like cruise, which literally does what it says in the tin. You can kind of set a heading and it'll just kind of carry on at that heading and you can get an awful lot of support. The most sophisticated modes are things like GPS loiter, where when you initiate it, if it's a multi-rotor, it'll just sit at that location in 3D space. If it's a fixed wing model, it'll actually um, go around that position and circle around that position that, that you entered loiter into. And you can almost like park the model, maybe, I don't know, uh, you're getting distracted or you've just been you know stung on your ankle by a wasp uh, you can, you've got a moment to sort yourself out and then you can kind of carry on with the flight and having that as a backup as a fail safe is actually very handy and then the last super duper mode is return to home and we've talked about that that's where the plane will actually climb to the safe altitude fly back to you and then circle over your head very handy as an oh dear switch and you can have that set so that it's even initiated when the battery starts to get too low and you have spotted it. Now when I'm setting up iNav I tend to follow the same steps every time. Let me go through them in the next slide and then when I cover them in the next couple of videos or if you go and watch one of my older iNav setup videos you'll kind of know what you're watching and the process to go through. The videos that I'm making here are not an excuse to not go and have a look at the iNav wiki. If you are interested in iNav spend some time get yourself a cup of tea cup of coffee and read all about it there's some really good stuff in there about how you set up fixed wing and it will save you a lot of hassle if you just spend a bit of time and read all about it so if you're not sure about something the wiki is a great place to have a look now when i install inav first of all i set up a basic radio setup so that's going to be the standard four controls throttle aileron elevator rudder in whichever order your radio sets them up. We can tell iNav how to uh, interpret that when you set that bit up later. I'd add two additional switches, a two position switch on channel five or six, and on the other channel, I would then set up a three position switch to select those flight modes that we've just talked about. You don't need anything fancy on the radio at all. That basic model will work for whatever you are gonna fly, multi-rotor, plane, wing, V-tail, slope or whatever it is now once that is done then i normally connect the flight controller up to the computer make sure it's all tickety-boo before we get too far into this and uh, then flash it with the latest version of inav you're gonna have to download a piece of software onto your computer and then flash it or upload the software or firmware as it's called onto this little computer and then that is what it's going to run once I've done that, I'll connect up the GPS onto one of the things called UART. Uh, UART is a universal uh, port and you can use it for anything. Uh, flight controllers like this have loads of them, and so we just plug it into a spare one. Similarly, if you're using FPV equipment, you're going to connect up your FPV camera and you're going to connect up your FPV transmitter. Then it's back onto the computer to configure the GPS and configure all the FPV bits and pieces too, and to tell iNav what you're about to install it into. And I do all of that outside of the model before I start plugging things in. Once the flight controller and the GPS is all set up in the model, then I install the servos into the right places, and iNav will tell you where that is, and with the prop off, uh, we'll then power it up for the first time, reconnect back to iNav, and then make sure that all the control surfaces are working in the right way, and all the middle positions are all lined up in the wings and everything, and that's all done in iNav. You don't use the trims on the radio for anything with iNav, you leave them well alone. Once that's all done, then we'll confirm that we can arm the flight controller and run the motor, hence why we're having the props off. Once we've done that, then we'll take it for a maiden flight, make sure that the basic stuff is working, and then there's a couple of things that we can fine tune afterwards. So hopefully that helps those of you that don't understand or weren't sure about what iNav was, how it worked, where it goes in the model, how all that works. Join me in the next video then where we'll start to go through the first part of that list and put iNav onto a flight controller like this and stick it in a model and get it flying.
Thank you for watching my video and watching right to the very end. If you want to find out what I'm currently working on, you can follow me on social media by searching for Painless360 in the usual places. If you'd like to become part of the inner circle, then you can become a Patreon. Details are in the description and you get lots of additional benefits. Check out the playlist section on the channel too. I organize all of my videos into playlists and it's called something like Introduction to Author Beginners. All of the content is aimed so that you can start at the very beginning and it teaches you that subject, starting with simple principles and moving up to teach you everything you need to know.